Welcome to the Learning Reinvented podcast brought to you by myself, Katie Gordon, and the team from The Learning Effect. There are lots of learning podcasts out there, so we wanted to do something slightly different. This week, we're discussing whether technology can change behaviour. I'm delighted to welcome Paul Matthews to the podcast. Thank you for joining me, Paul. Now, Paul, you've been a guest on our podcast before, but do you want to reintroduce yourself to our listeners and give a bit more on your background? Oh, a bit more. Okay. Well, anyway, I grew up on a farm in New Zealand, um, so it's a long way from there to here. So thank you for uh, inviting me onto the podcast again. Um, and uh, so other than the farm, and I ended up uh, starting my professional career as an engineer, uh, designing farm machinery, actually. So, so that farming and engineering background tend to keep me focused on practical stuff and what works, you know, perhaps even regardless of what the theory might tell us. So I'm very focused on what works in practice. Um, like many Kiwis, I headed out into the world and travelled all about living and working in many countries and ended up in the UK, did a few C-suite level jobs. And then I founded my company, People Alchemy, where we we focus on enabling behaviour change and improving work performance. So, and we use technology to do that. So I guess that's really the subject of this this this, this podcast is how technology and behaviour change can can fit together. Awesome. Thank you for that, Paul. I think we'll get started. So um, can you give your explanation of what learning is and why organisations have learning functions? Oh, that's a that's a high level question, isn't it? That's like a, a purpose for existence. Um, <laughs> I, I think if if you take it back a step and and the, the status quo in an organisation is is never good enough. And, and what I mean by that is I've never, ever heard a manager in an organisation say all our people are doing what they need to do and don't need to do it any better. So there's always this gap between the way that people are doing things and the way that we would wish them to be doing those things. In other words, there's a behavioural gap. Um, there's the behaviours we have now and the behaviours that we would prefer them to be uh, you know, exhibiting and using when they are out there you know, executing all of the things that we ask them to do. Um, and then you've got to think also about the future needs. So even if they're doing well enough now, um, then how can we get them to be better in the future when we will be doing different things? Because the strategy will no doubt evolve and change in terms of what it requires of them. Um, so what new skills and behaviours might be needed in the future when you're doing workforce planning um, and so on? So I think in a nutshell, l and D is there to help managers with the competency of their teams as they execute the organisational strategy. That, that's, it, it, it's about collaborating and working with managers. Um, and, and then it's about helping people do what they need to do to get that strategy executed efficiently and effectively. And, and notice I didn't really put anything in there about learning, um, which is uh, interesting when you think about what's the purpose of the learning function. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think it's interesting. I think it's how you perceive learning as well, because learning can be anything. So it can be reading a news article or listening to a podcast like this one. Or is if you're taking in from informa taking in information um, and retaining that information and using that, I think personally, I think that's considered learning, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, yeah. The question was why an organisation has a learning function. So mm -hmm. a lot of learning will happen informally, which is not really usually in the purvey of the learning function within an organisation. Um, so much informal learning just happens. Um, mm -hmm. with the side effect of life, to be perfectly honest. So, um, but when you're talking about the learning function, it, I think it's got this its purpose has got to be about working with management to help teams deliver on that strategy and there's a number of things they can do to assist that but most of what they will need to be doing outside of compliance and regulatory type stuff will be assisting people to do different things and do things differently in other words to change their behaviors in order to get better at executing that strategy yeah most definitely so how do you think technology can be used to promote behavior change so, OK, well, the first thing is let's keep this in the organisational arena because behaviour change, you know, covers all sorts of things outside of the workplace. So if we keep this in a work context, 
think about how behavior will change in a work context. And that's usually incrementally, usually step by step. Uh, there's sort of, at some point, there's some kind of call to action or a desire to change. Um, and then we figure out how to do it or someone helps us understand how to do it or what is required. We maybe learn something. Maybe we remember something we used to know and have temporarily forgotten. We experiment. We reflect on what happened when we experiment. We practice. We get some feedback. We go around again. We talk to some people. It, it takes time and effort and a repetitive process, typically an iterative process rather, to get a behavior established and then even better habitual. Um, so it is just the way we now do things here. Um, so there's many activities involved in getting a behavior uh, from starting to embedding it so it's sustained and sustainable. And, and one thing you've always got to remember is usually that behavior is not new, it's a replacement in the sense that it is replacing some other behavior. So while you're doing it, you've also got to say, well, we don't want what they were doing before. We want this new thing we want them to do. How can we help them start doing the new thing, but do it in a way that automatically stops them doing the old thing? Um, so there is often this need to unlearn as well as to learn. Um, and, and even if it's a quick behavior change, you know, like for this little particular operation, folded on the right, not on the left. That's a very simple instruction and people can start doing that immediately. But very often they still need repetitions to practice that and for it to become habitual. It's amazing how a lot of that stuff gets into muscle memory. Um, one analogy I use for the technology piece is the sat-nav. So there's, there's four critical success factors there um, when you're thinking about a sat-nav. You've got to know where you are. You've got to know where you want to go. You need a set of step-by-step, turn-by-turn instructions. And you've got to follow them. So those are the four things you've got to have in place for that sat nav adventure to be successful. And you can use that analogy when you're thinking about behavior change in an organization. We've got to know behaviorally where we are now, what's happening out there right now. What do we want instead of that? In other words, what's our behavioral destination? What do we want instead of what's currently happening? Um, what are the steps that we could design to take place over time that will take people from where they are behaviorally now to where we want them to be behaviorally at some point in the future, maybe a couple of months down the track, depending obviously on the type of behavior that you're seeking to change. Um, and then of course, we have to hold them accountable for doing all those steps along that journey, that behavioral change journey. And this is where technology can come in is, we need to be able to develop the step-by-step -step process to take people uh, along their journey from what they're doing now to what we want them to do instead. Now, clearly along the way, there will be points at which they will need to learn something. It's almost inevitable. But learning is only a small part of behavior change. There's a lot of practice, repetition, feedback, all of those things that need to go in place. And if you're talking about 100 people with 100 activities each, you know, over a few months, you're, you're talking about thousands and thousands of, of activities that you need to track, you need to deliver on time to these people when it's due that they do this next activity, and so on. So there's, that's where technology comes in, really, is helping manage the volume of stuff, and then getting data uh, out of that, that will help you understand, are we being successful? How can we improve what we're doing and move forward on that? So it's sort of, it's a bit of an answer to how technology can be used, but there's other ways as well, other than that kind of learning journey I just outlined. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I think that's really interesting. And I think the, the sat nav examples, uh, a good example, definitely. But um, we've kind of heard the explana explanation of, of how technology can help, but what, what do you think the challenges might be using technology um, to change behavior? I, well, I think there's several there. And of course, actually, we could step back to the previous question slightly and say that because because the challenges with technology are things like access and, um, you know, can people get to it? Uh, yeah. and, and where we can draw a leaf from some of the things where behavior changes um, that we've seen. So, for example, uh, the movie Jaws gave a lot of people a water swimming phobia. Now, that's behavior change from a movie. So. The movie is such an immersive thing that people 
it it changes the way that people think. It changes some of their underpinning assumptions of how the world works, and therefore their behavior changes as a result of that. So that's using technology, but a rather expensive way to do it. Um, you know, a few hundred million to to, yeah. to build a movie to <laughs> make a change in behavior in a small company isn't going to work. Um, and another another way is immersive technology. Again, probably somewhat more expensive, but less so these days. Where you're using VR for stuff. I mean, one example I heard recently, which was amazing, is um, uh, organizations looking for donations were actually going to high net worth individuals and showing them a VR of a refugee camp. In other words, taking them oh, wow. at least in, from a VR perspective into a refugee camp and showing them the yeah. condition, say, we need water here. We need this. We need that. Can you help? And of course, it was a much more visceral response to that VR version rather than a you know a picture of a starving refugee. So there's there's lots of ways to use technology to to drive behavior change, but when you are seeking to design it and work with it in an organizational context, you you kind of have to use that learning workflow sort of concept I outlined I outlined earlier. And and then that then the challenges start kicking in. Of course, one of them inevitably technology is access. You know, can people get to it? If they're not commonly using a laptop or a an, or a tablet or a computer at work, how are they going to get access to it? Um, in some and, and many organisations, many employees don't have an email address or a work one, and so how then do you send them notifications and stuff like that? I mean, we had to tackle these kind of things with our platform, and so we've got a you know a text message gateway built into it to handle employees who who don't have access to email. Um, or if they do, don't regularly use it. Um, other challenges. Uh, another one is the same old, same old problem. That is, people have poor previous experiences with typically just with e-learning off the shelf or, you know, fairly clunky e-learning. And they say, well, learning online doesn't work or it's not very nice. Or even if, if it was good information, it was horrible to use. So there's a whole lot of baggage that comes with the concept of of technology and learning that a lot of people need to get past. And that can be quite a big barrier when you're trying to implement it. Um, and, and there's this perception often that online learning is inferior to the classroom. It isn't, by the way, if it's done well, it's 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 at least as good, if not superior in evidence. There's plenty of research that says that. Um, but these days people use a tech a lot. So, you know, I think you know the barriers aren't what they used to be when IT literacy was a was a more of a problem. I think that's seldom an issue now. I mean, but clearly, whatever you build's got to be at least easier to use than Facebook. <laughs> so, uh... no, most definitely, I I completely agree with you. I think budget's a big one um, when it comes to challenge um, and picking the right technology. Um, I've seen learning um, out there, which is like a VR for fire safety, for example, but. Is it really necessary for fire safety because you're teaching all your colleagues that I'm sure that yeah. that would be quite expensive to be doing that. So I think it's picking it right um, and putting in the right technology as well. Mm -hmm. Well, budget's always an issue, whatever we're doing, mm -hmm. and depending on the organisation. And I was at a conference recently and um, Diageo was doing a, a talk on what they do. And they just seemed to have as much money as they needed to do what they wanted, which was amazing. But of course, it made everybody else in the audience feel somewhat yeah. left behind or jealous of their ability to kind of experiment and play with stuff. Yeah. Um, and most organizations don't have pockets that deep. And, no. and some of them have almost nothing. So you, you do have to be careful about what's designed. And it's usually an iterative process to you know get a budget that suits the design and then vice versa. I think we're going into kind of an exciting era with it and then the potential of what you can create though like given that we've kind of got AI um, that's heavily spoken about at the moment but you've got lots of tools that are AI based etc that help you make that content as well so I think I think it will change things up a bit in regards to kind of the budget thing um, and the technology that's being used as well. Yeah. I think so the AI is an it? interesting one because I think it will help um, make some things more cost effective or cheaper to do. Yeah. Uh, but I think that there's a real, to me, there's a real problem with AI is 
if you using AI to help you do something that's ineffective faster and better, mm -hmm. you've still got an ineffective solution. And I think yeah. there's a lot of things that people are doing in L and L and D organizationally at the moment that are, well, quite frankly, broken. Yeah. Um, because they're just not getting the kind of ROI results and impact that that really they should be or could be, and speeding those things up. It's I remember in my days of computing and when I was first at university, a lecturer used to say, if you you know if 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 the systems you've got are crap, and you speed them up with the computer, all you get is fast crap. Yeah. So, <laughs> like this podcast, but it, it's there is a real potential problem. So, Paul, we've talked about the challenges of using technology. So what are the benefits? Um, well, there's an immediacy about technology so that it's available now for many people. Um, and that's, you know, rather than wait for something that is uh, delivered by another person. Um, in terms of um, you get visibility because you get data out of systems. And if you're clever with that data, you can learn an awful lot about how people are interacting, what they're struggling with, how you might need to help them, and also how you can improve the program you've got. So you've got all that kind of stuff. Um, clearly, there's a whole scalability thing. Uh, if you build it for one person, you can roll it out for thousands. Um, so th there's those kinds of things. And of course, if you're rolling it out to large numbers of people, whatever you're doing will tend to be a lot more cost effective than, you know, having to use people and people's time to deliver training or coaching or some kind of personal face to face intervention, even if that's done with cohorts and groups. Yeah. Um, and by technology here, I'm also meaning even this things like recording a video of someone doing something. Um, so it isn't just a big e-learning course. There's all sorts of ways technology can be used. And I think what's coming soon with technology, of course, is and, and is even starting to be available now, is the idea of a mentor or a coach that is actually AI um, who can do a lot of the heavy lifting of helping someone through a program. Uh, and there's work going on now about creating the perfect tutor. So let's go model the tutor's that we currently have who are doing a really good job what are they doing that's different how can we create an avatar of that lecturer or teacher or trainer and then have the ai um, behind the avatar to to you know to sort of interact with students um, so i think there's a good chance that there's going to be quite a big jump in quality improvement of what people can get to when AI becomes involved because it will enable us to do things like that. I mean, that's not going to come in the next few months, but it's certainly going to come in the next few years at the rate that AI is changing. So the other advantage of technology, of course, is we can start bringing AI into the mix, um, but we've got to be careful of what I talked about earlier, that we don't just create something that is still ineffective, but a lot faster at being ineffective than what we had earlier. You know, if something is inherently broken, don't make it faster, but still broken. So I think technology can give us lots of insights because of the data. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, so there, there's just a few benefits. I think there's a, there's a lot more as a huge shopping list of stuff that is available. Um, but there's just a few. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. Um, and I think, like you said, um, if you're just recreating something and putting it uh, a technical spin on it, like i.e. changing something from face to face to online, but the content's not right, it's still not going to fix anything. Yeah. Um, and I've seen like people implement learning systems before, um, hoping that that would then solve all their issues, but it's not. Um, because you have to get it embedded, it, people have to be engaged with the platform, etc. So there's there are lots of challenges that come with technology as well. It's not going to be there to solve all your issues. Um, you have to work hard at that. And I think that's going to be the same with AI going forward. Obviously, it's going to take probably a lot of um, time away from doing stuff and it's going to make things quicker. But you have to embed that right and you have to use it correctly as well. Hey, hey. Technology can make what is already good better. It'll be yeah. 
oil oil the oil the gears and what have you but if you know that that's the thing is you've got to get clever about what you're doing and making sure that it's fit for purpose and then apply technology to that rather than go and buy shiny new technology and try and find a problem you know to solve <laughs> with what you've just bought most um, definitely yeah so yeah so what's next for you paul on your journey um for me i i i mean I, from a work perspective i mean keep beating the drum of fixing what most organizations still do in lnd which does not work so well quite frankly i, I think lnd by and large is broken in most places um now it's not that it's doing no good at all but i think there's a lot more it could be doing and should be doing and a lot of that to me is just down to the mindset of the people that are using it about their focus about they'll tend to think about how do we deliver this curriculum rather than how do we deliver this behavior you know yeah. we started this podcast talking about you know behaviors and how can we use technology to enhance and enable behavior change so really the question should be how do we deliver this behavior now that we've defined the behaviors we want how do we deliver them um and rather than think well what curriculum or what topics and then how do we deliver this curriculum uh, i think that's so just it just doesn't work and it, it's it's well, it's come down from the victorian era we've inherited all sorts of things and of course what's happened in technology and learning is we built these systems to more or less promote that whole content heavy content centric approach to learning which again comes down from the victorian school era if you want to um, yeah be critical of it. so i think there's a real need to shift that mindset so that's really the soapbox i'm standing on is how do you shift the mindset of l d to think much more critically about its value proposition and how it can fulfill that with the business effectively um, by focusing on what the business needs rather than thinking about learning as a separate thing in its own right. No, definitely. I completely agree. And I think we're talking about behaviour change in general and uh, and in an organisational sense. But I think it would be useful in some instances if behaviour change happened within the learning department in order to kind of spark creativity um, and maybe change up how we um, deliver learning so it isn't that kind of Victorian era style learning that, that we're all kind of used to. Well, certainly, the, yeah, you're right. Behaviour change starts at home. You know, it's, mm. you know, we need to be focusing on, as an L and D people, what are we doing about ourselves in terms of encouraging us to be, and behave the way that we need to be doing it to deliver 21st century, you know, um, performance capability into the organisations we work with. Yeah, definitely. So. Thank you very much for joining us today, Paul. I think we could uh, carry on the conversation much longer. Um, but if people wanted to connect with you and uh, follow your story, what should they do? Um, well, uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I, and any messages, any questions, if they want to ask something, I'm very happy to respond. So just get in touch with me on LinkedIn. And we've got a couple of websites. The, the company one is at peoplealchemy.com. And then I've got my personal one, which has my books and other things like that um, at paul-matthews.com. Um, so, yeah, um, but don't expect another book on that website because <laughs> I think three, three books is enough for any trilogy, in my opinion. So. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but there's lots um, of stuff on both of those sites to go and download, to grab, just free resources, videos to watch, all sorts. So just go and browse and Hopefully what's there is useful and it's free. So fill your boots. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Paul. We'll put the, the, those links in the show notes below. Excellent. Well, it's been great to have a chat. And as you say, this is a conversation that could could run and run. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm much more keen to get people out there doing stuff in relation to this and, and focusing on those behaviours. Oh, most definitely. And I'm sure we'll have uh, more podcasts in, in the future as well. All righty. Thank you, Paul. Thanks very much. Bye then. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Learning Reinvented podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. If you've not already done so, please follow our podcast. And if the learning effect can help you and your organisation, please do get in touch. You can find both James and Katie on LinkedIn and our contact details are in the show notes below.